Let's so, give it up for Caroline. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, good. Okay, awesome. Well, as Meredith said, I'm Caroline Frett. I'm from Capstone IT. I'm one of the account managers and I'll be your host for today. <laughs> so first off, who here loves free stuff? Anyone? Raise hands. Okay, got a few. Um, so quick heads up, we have a raffle towards the end. Um, stay tuned for that. Just scan the QR code on the screen before it disappears and we're raffling off a $300 gift card. So now I have a question for you. So how many of you know, or think you know, what Capstone IT is all about? Raise your hand. Okay, looks like we have some work to do. <laughs> um, well, whether you raise your hand or not, let me give you a little insight on Capstone IT. We aren't just another IT and engineering staffing firm, we're a value-focused staffing firm. Uh, we are proudly celebrating 25 years in business uh, as of January. So for 25 years, we've been passionately aligning the right tech talent with the right companies. We've got a snazzy new office in downtown Salt Lake, right next to Kern, if anyone's ever been to Kern. And then it symbolizes our commitment to innovation and community in the tech world here in Utah. We really hope you drop by. I'd love to get chat with you. April would love to chat with you. So we'd love to get to know you. So please stop by. So... Now I'm curious about who's in the room today. Raise your hand if you're a CIO, CTO, or a C-level, anyone? Hey, we got quite a few, nice. Thanks for coming. Um, how about, is there anyone here who owns their own business among us? Looks like the same people, <laughs> nice to see you guys. <laughs> and then um, how about anyone who man manages a team, even if you've only met your team virtually? Okay, wow. Quite a few. So no matter your role at Capstone IT, we tailor our approach to suit your unique needs. Um, CIOs, CTOs, any of those C-levels, we understand the strategic challenges you face. Entrepreneurs, we know the agility your team requires. IT managers, we get the complexities of your projects. We believe in making connections that matter. For example, we recently helped a Fortune 500 company that was struggling to find the right tech talent. Not sure if you've ever struggled finding the right tech talent, spent hours trying to find talent. Um, so for this specific example, um, to, we were helping them to fill their software development team. So anyone from QA to software developers to UI UX. Um, and, but not only that, it was to help alleviate the hundreds of hours their hiring managers were spending interviewing hundreds of hours, their HR was spending um, looking for the right talent. And instead of focusing on their strategic goals, they needed someone not just with the right skill set, but the right personality, a good cultural fit. We stepped in, and guess what? We saved them hundreds of hours um, and guaranteed our candidate placements. From there, they were so impressed with our collaboration, the exceptional results we delivered, um, and our commitment to value-driven interactions with all the parties involved, that they entered into an exclusive staffing agreement with us for many years. So, and speaking of perfect matches, um, today's keynote speaker is a testament to the power of aligning passion with profession. Mark Campbell is the CIO at Evotech. His career includes impressive roles and daring choices like leaving a secure job for a startup that's made history. And guess what? He's not just about tech and startups. Mark once bravely served on an aircraft carrier for the military. Plus he's a scuba diving enthusiast, often diving with his, and get this, 82 year old mother. He's here to share his insights on generative AI, which I'm sure will enlighten and inspire all of you. Please welcome Mark Campbell. Oh, thank, thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, my mom's 82 years old. She's about this tall, she's a little bitty, bitty thing. She still kicks my butt underwater though. So, hey, it is great to be here in Utah. I used to live in Utah. You guys ever heard of a place in Utah called Bluff? Yeah, you guys ever heard of a place called Price? 
Yeah, yeah. Anyone from there? Hands up. No, no, no. I'm not shocked. So I used to live just outside of Price, a little place called Draggerton. But the citizens there, they didn't like the name of the town. So they all got together, got their marketing crew together. It's now known as East Carbon. Dude, I want a job on the East Carbon marketing team because that's got to be like the easiest job in the whole world. Anyway, like I say, it is great to be back here in Utah. Um, today's topic, very, very top of mind for many technical groups out there, generative AI. Uh, the reason I'm up on stage for whatever twist of fate, I wound up working on artificial intelligence a long time ago. And I mean so long ago, it's not really even cool. I built my first neural network in 1993. You can believe that. Yeah, all the computers were powered by coal and steam back then. Uh, but things have come a long way. So it's, it's really interesting to see where things are, where they're shaping up, where they're going. Now, you heard earlier that uh, I'm from a company called Evotech. And let's see if I can, okay, maybe we'll just have to call ourselves Evo because the tech part of it, there we go. So um, anyway, Evotech, we are a uh, solutions integrator and reseller. We focus primarily on cybersecurity, cloud, uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have a number of different uh, activities that we do. We typically work at the advisory level, uh, but we also continue all the way down through uh, the various departments and operations. An interesting group inside Evotech is Evotech Labs. That's the group I work for. We focus solely on emerging tech. We're partnered with 23 of the world's top uh, venture firms. Uh, we are also partnered with several of the uh, universities uh, around there, so we get to see kind of tech as it's hitting that bubbling test tube phase and emerging onto market. So uh, been writing and speaking on AI, uh, generative AI in sp specifically since uh, 2014. So like I said, that's almost so long now, it's not really even cool to say. But we're gonna dive into the AI landscape today and kind of start decomposing it a little bit. By the way, how many people here have heard of AI? <laughs> wow, well, look at that. Three of you, that's great, that's great. So here's where we are today. Now, some of these statistics here, um, are they're, they're changing. I literally had to change one of these last night. So of companies out there planning to spend or increase their spend on AI, does this number seem about right to you that more than half of the companies plan to spend more on AI? Seems a little bit low? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, kind of a captain obvious statistic. Um, but look at this, uh, in the next 12 months, not just spend more, but actually deploy an AI app, we're seeing about four out of every five companies saying that they're gonna bring something to market in the next year. Does that include any of y'all? That's Southern Utah language. Yeah, so we got a bunch here, that's great, good. Um, this is how much was invested by the venture capital uh, community last year. Uh, this is a number that was just released. So that's 27 billion with a B. To put that in perspective, one of the cornerstones of tech has always been storage. Last year, uh, VC investment in storage was 1.3 billion. So to put that, kind of put that in comparison there. That's uh, pretty shocking. One quarter of every venture dollar spent last year was uh, on 25%. The rest went to the snacks that are outside. 73% of India use generative AI on a daily basis. Now, that, that's an amazing number, but when you compare it to the US where it's just under half, think about the growth opportunity here in the United States for artificial intelligence. So these are all uh, great stats, wonderful and everything, but when we put this into the technical landscape, this is where things get a little bit complex. So this is from a company called CD Insights. By the way, I'm not a salesperson for CD Insights, but if you don't get their newsletter, you're missing out on a trick, it's free. Go look them up online, sign up for it. But they track uh, a ton of emerging tech. You'll find out things from CD Insights long before other research firms that have magic quadrants. Um, if we take a look at that complex landscape and just drill in on one of the boxes, you can see that there's a whole layer down below that. So there are literally thousands of uh, startups hitting the AI space right now. Uh, I would like to tell you, and they'll all be around a year from now. That's probably not true. Um, however, there is a number of uh, 
um, we believe really disruptive technologies that are embedded in this forest of solutions here. So I'm gonna start. How many people know how generative AI works and built it themselves? We've got some folks here, we've got some folks in the back. Okay, so you guys can sleep in this part of it here. For those that aren't sure about the distinction between regular old garden variety AI and um, uh, generative AI, the biggest difference is most AI up until say maybe about seven, eight years ago, consumed data, made a decision and produced a result. Generative AI is a little bit different than that in that it consumes all of its data in the training phases. And then from thereafter, it creates data, images, voice, text. You guys have all played with chat GPT. You've all written, a, you know, had it write you a Shakespearean sonnet about the jazz winning the championship. Anyway, um, let's talk a little bit about under the covers because this will set the stage for what we have going on. So let's pretend that you had millions of pictures of hot dogs, as we all do. And you decide to take a particular type of AI called a discriminator. And all the discriminator is going to do is give you a thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm going to show it a picture. It's going to say, that's a hot dog. Nah, that ain't a hot dog. Okay, and we're going to repeat this training cycle millions of times until the discriminator gets very, very good at identifying hot dogs. Okay, we're going to take a different type of AI called a generator. And what a generator does is it's going to generate some random output, random text, random images, random pixels, random video, what have you. And it's gonna hand it to the discriminator, the discriminator and say, is this a hot dog, not a hot dog? And the discriminator is gonna tell it, if it's not a hot dog, it's gonna say, yeah, there's just, there's no cylindrical kind of shapes in this, what have you. And that feedback gets repeated gajillions of times until the generator gets better, better, better at generating pictures of hot dogs. Now, at this point, we can stop the training and we can have the generator actually create Lots of pictures of hot dogs. And really, the whole industry is about pictures of hot dogs. That's exactly what we do. Okay, so what do you do with this? Well, obviously, we can train on data other than pictures of hot dogs. I'm going to show you some startups that we've looked at over the past couple of weeks. I don't mean months, but past couple of weeks that are using generative AI to produce some rather remarkable results. I'm not going to tell you, you know, about the ones that you've seen on CNN and in the news and, and so forth. So one is a company called Glean. Again, I'm not here to sell any of these. I, I don't make a commission off any of this stuff. But when a, a startup comes along and turns our heads, they're doing something a little bit different. We think that if we're interested in it, you guys will, will be too. So tell me if we're right or wrong on that. But what Glean does is it takes your enterprise data, your org chart, your HR policies, your sales data, uh, whatever it is you would like to feed it, and now you have a very smart search capability for your company. So you could say, what are the sales objectives for the uh, bluff area? And you know, and they could say, well, 15 trillion. And you could get who owns that, when would it come about, who came up with this material? Um, you can drill down into it. You could ask for, could you concisely tell me how services did in Q3 last year? Boom, and you'll have all of that output. So there's some very interesting goals that you can set up with this. What that makes it very, very powerful for is from within inside your, your company, it kind of breaks that cycle of going to the data group saying, I'd like to run some analytics you know, on sales data. And could you put that into a report? Could you have that by the board meeting at the end of the quarter? This is at your fingertips where you can go in and query and pull up with it. There's a, by the way, if, you, if any of you are security minded, you'll imagine there's got to be some constraints on this. If I said, so how much did the CEO make last year, right? So there'll, there'll have to be a little bit of role-based access control, which is built into great. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, here's another one, Coding Guru. So right now you can go out to any number of uh, generative AI platforms and ask it to generate code. Okay, pretty, pretty run of the mill at this point. Um, there are even specialized ones like, say, GitHub Copilot as an example, and you can have it generate very specific code. Here's where it's getting really cool. There's a company out there called Cursor, and they're trying to take that to the next level, and here's how they're doing it. They're using a very focused model that doesn't know all the rules of cricket. It doesn't know the capital of Bolivia. All it's been trained on is code, 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 code. It has also been trained on bugs zero days, 
coding styles, coding practices, coding efficiencies, coding performance, such that when you have code, instead of asking it, can you write me a code, uh, some code to sort the phone book, you're able to actually ask it very, very intricate questions about what a particular piece of code does. Can you explain that to me? You should be able to uh, type in something like, uh, can you create some error handling for this code? And by the way, how many coders are out here? Oh, we, we got a whole bunch. By the way, most of them are sitting in the front. So that's an A, first off. Okay. You can also uh, ask it, is there a bug in this code? And where it goes through and we'll do an analysis of the analysis. And instead of just highlighting the code and saying, yeah, this is a null pointer, it actually is going to give you the rationale behind why that's suspected to be a bug. Right. So this is uh, code genius on steroids. Um, another one, how about an LLM for your LLMs? For LLM, large language model like ChatGPT. Um, the idea here, a company called Backplane decided, look, if we go to companies and take a peek at what LLMs they're using, we're going to find they're using four, five, six, seven different LLMs out there. What if we put that all together into a portal? And if you ask, uh, what is the run and gun offense? Uh, you're going to get five different answers from five different LLMs it maybe knows that your preference is for BART, and it will give you that answer. And you can hit a button and just say another, 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 or it could take those and conglomerate those together and get various outputs from various uh, various LLMs. Now, the cool thing about that is the number of LLMs is growing, and they're not all created equal, as you guys are quite aware. But as an example, you can ask all kinds of things. Uh, of the LLMs and get these great answers back. That's all pretty run of the mill. Except look at this, look at this discussion right here. Because Backplane is kind of that focal point of prompts going to LLMs, you can start putting guardrails on the prompts. So our funky little example up here where you're asking it um, a, a bunch of different questions and then you're asking it very specifically about you know, some, some personal information. And it's jumping out there and saying, hey, we can't, we, we can't do that. Does that seem interesting? Is that novel? Have you guys seen something like this before? Captain Obvious, something new, something cool, something sexy, something you'll tell your grandparents? All the above. Awesome. Okay. Middleware for AI. This is one uh, literally that we saw Thursday last week. Um, this is a company called MindsDB. The concept here is a lot of times we have an LLM, but we want to make it our own LLM. We want to make it the best mortgage LLM in the industry, the best flight reservation system, what have you. Uh, there's typically a challenge of how do I take my regular pile of smoldering data and get that into a training cycle and into a model in production that is tailored for what my particular business has, along with security guardrails, along with all that great stuff. It's a very noble cause, very difficult to do in reality. Um, the other thing is, as things are happening in production, how do I use that to feed back into my uh, training data so that I can select data maybe in a little bit smarter way? Maybe I can get rid of some of the noise. Maybe I can uh, merge in another data source. MindsDB is doing this in an automated fashion. Um, you won't be shocked to know that it has AI under the covers to help figure a lot of this out. So super interesting product just came to mind. Uh, another company out there, Patronus. Now Patronus, uh, think of them as kind of the referee for your AI. They'll go ahead and run statistics on your AI models that you've made. Maybe highlight some areas of concern. Maybe give you some insights. Uh, look at this. One of their statistics they take a look at is toxicity. Holy cow, I hope we don't run it on my email. These guys right here doing fascinating stuff where they're actually analyzing this and giving you some guidance on how effective, how toxic, uh, how often are hallucinations present uh, in your particular models. Good stuff. Okay, but you guys get the idea, right? A lot of products. I could be up here for a very, very long time. The topic that we're talking about was road mapping. So far, I really haven't showed you any road mapping. We've kind of set the stage on what generative AI is and some of the applications and how that's manifesting itself. So when we talk about road mapping, we're really talking about finding a, a path that navigates you through the risks that artificial intelligence presents, along with the opportunities that it's able to leverage. And that's not, that's not an obvious or trivial task. 
So kind of business 101, you guys know all of this stuff. There's four levels in any company. When you start doing your planning, you have your why. Any Simon Sinek fans out there, great book on the topic. Um, you, that's the corporate level and strategic level. This is the what, hey, you know, what are we going to do? The who on the tactical side, who's going to do what? How do we get this all going? And the operational is the how. Well, generative AI is having very disruptive impacts on those bottom three levels. There may be companies out there uh, re-examining their existential reason for being in business, um, but uh, for the most part, it's these three bottom layers of corporate planning that are being turned on their head. Well, let's take a look at what exactly that means. When we have these opportunities and risks out there, we really need to come up with a roadmap process that helps us identify, as an example, do we get rid of all of the risks in AI? And then let's go ahead and implement something and exploit an opportunity. That's probably not a realistic one. Uh, by the way, we have another customer that told me, I don't want to hear anything about the risk. My CEO says I have to have an AI product out by the end of quarter, full steam ahead. That might be a headline, you know, in the coming months. And I hope not, but, uh, but right. So it isn't as easy as, well, let's just take the opportunities and we'll just kind of fix the risks uh, as we go along. Probably not a mature process. So, I'm going to give you an example here. This is uh, stratifying for us right now. These are the 12 most common risks our customers are talking about and trying to mitigate. And then these are the 12 most common opportunities that they're looking to exploit. Now, with every customer, this list is going to be slightly different. Next week, this list could be slightly different just in the, the rapid changing that we're seeing in technologies uh, in this space. But here's the process that we go through. So first off, we go through that identification phase. Here are the daring dozen and the dirty dozen, if you want to think about them in that respect. And from that, you can see where those products I just showed you, where they fit in. And hence why they were picked instead of a bunch from one area. So, so there are tools out there to help you with most of these uh, specific areas. We'll then sit down with the customer and go through and analyze these. What does this mean for this particular company? Um, for instance, we'll take a look at impact. Is this a high impact? If we if we have this today um, and it worked perfectly, what impact would it be? There'd be some things that are like, yeah, well, we don't really do that here. There's other things that would revolutionize the, your industry, um, catapult you in front of the competition, what have you. So that's relatively straightforward to go through. No, no big scientific numbers here. Thumbs up, thumbs down, I don't know. That's basically it. The next thing we do is we go, okay, well, how feasible is it? I made that assumption earlier that this all worked and it worked perfectly. How feasible is that? Well, we may not have the budget, we may not have the schedule, we may not have the skills. By the way, if you don't have the skills, call Capstone IT. They have offices near current in downtown Salt Lake City. Um, but uh, putting that together, there may be some feasibility concerns. Uh, by the way, sometimes feasibility has to do with culture, right? We have an executive that hates change, only buys 3.0 products. Well, this might not be the right time or the, or, or the right org to, to kick this off on. In going through that, you can kind of see in your mind that we're forming a three by three matrix. And there's going to be things that from that matrix that fit into the very high impact very feasible. Well, that's kind of the no-brainer category. The other one is, uh, I don't know how we're going to do it, and it's not going to be a very much impact. That's the other no-brainer. The other stuff in between, we're going to leave for now. So we're going to focus on three use cases. I'll just explain what these ones are. AI risk literacy. Many companies at the HR level haven't talked to their employees about, did you know that when you put a prompt into chat GPT with HIPAA information in it, you just broke the law? Like, did you know that? So there are things just getting the literacy out there. Most companies have things like acceptable use policies. Right now, it's kind of geared towards smartphones and company computers. But what is your company's acceptable use policy for going out on ChatGPT and trying to figure out how to make an explosive device? Um, there should be something, something in there. So AI risk literacy is huge at a lot of our customers. By the way, and again, I do point out, this is an example. I'm not saying you have to start with these three, but for most customers, these bubble up near the top. In-house LLM, uh, many customers are saying, well, ChatGPT is great and wonderful. I would really like to bring one in-house, train it on my stuff, and make it do stuff for my customers, and I want it to be private and secure. That's what we call an in-house LLM. 
If you were super savvy and had a photographic memory, you'll realize on one of the previous charts, in-house LLM is an opportunity. It's also a risk. As soon as you build an in-house LLM, you've just created a target for the baddies. To be. And unless you've got a very savvy uh, security group, they probably don't have the defenses in place to protect an AI model. By the way, great topic if you're interested in for that. Okay, data leakage. We mentioned earlier that uh, should you put HIPAA information or PII or uh, any type of information into a uh, large language model, especially one that's off the shelf, you're potentially running a risk of leaking data out into the public. Even if you're using your own in-house uh, models, you stand a chance of leaking data. For instance, if you go out and start selecting new data sets uh, from public corpus, um, someone outside your company could hone in on well, what are you looking at, right? You've just in it, you've let, you've leaked indirect data. There's great news on that. There are some terrific products out there. Most companies have some DLP or CASB tool already in house, and there are really cool features that are being brought on board with those. So if you happen to have one of those, ask them. Can you detect generative AI and how do you stop uh, data leakage uh, through generative AI? Anyway, so you would pick your first three. You would then go ahead and phase them, rough phases. This will start this quarter, this is next quarter. This one has to start on Thursday. After that, we're then gonna go in and go in and implement them. The AI implementation, everyone's got their own SDLC, uh, their own ops process, their own CI CD. So every company is going to vary, but in general, it breaks down into an assessment, a development, and an employment phase. So you can start getting these mapped out. Again, this is road mapping. We're not necessarily putting dates, times, names, and budget amounts yet at this point. We're mapping this all out. Then this is the assessment. So for the particular use cases we've got up there, we have a detailed assessment that we go through where we harvest what a company already has, what they're already doing. Uh, resources that are already available and how that affects things, where the gaping holes are, where the best opportunities are. You get the idea. Okay, so little four-phase process with identify, analyze, um, then we go ahead and phase it out and then we implement it. But here's the key. Instead of then just going and grabbing the next things on the list, we're going to stop. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning and start our identification again. Now that sounds like we're wasting a lot of work. We already did this just a while ago. But if this takes you, let's say, six months, the industry has changed. Those companies I showed you earlier, um, they've all come out just within the past weeks. And so six months from now, uh, there's going to be new regulations. There's going to be new products. Uh, some big company, I guarantee, will have its AI breached and a bunch of bad stuff happen, and it'll be in the news. All of these things have a bearing on that next cycle. Okay. So... This is what our takeaway is. We need to do the identification of what the risks and opportunities are, and more importantly, what level they fit into, whether that's strategic, tactical, operational. We need to go ahead and, and uh, analyze those to make sure we've got our handle on how that all works. We need to go ahead and phase these out because it's not going to be a big bang. And then we're actually going to do the work and we're going to repeat. Does that make sense? Is that like Captain Obvious for everyone? Like, yeah, I knew that, Mark. That they do that in school nowadays. Hopefully that does provide you a framework. Um, taking a look at the impact and feasibility of each of these. Um, a lot of great work by Dr. Rick Hubbard, if you ever read any of his material that came up with the technique for that, I can't say that I, but anyway, good material. Okay, there are frameworks that are being put into place right now to help guide this. Um, you guys heard of any of these groups? Yeah, 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 all of them. One you may not have heard about is this data provenance initiative. And that's really picking up steam. It was started by a company called Cohere. If you guys are uh, AI uh, aficionados, you've probably heard of Cohere. This is a new type of a framework. We haven't had this before in the industry. And the reason that we're taking a look at data provenance is, um, is that one of the attacks against AI models is called data poisoning. So if I went in, let's say you were training an autonomous vehicle, how to navigate the streets of Salt Lake City, and you were going through a training phase, and I went in and got rid of every example of a yield sign, you would probably still train. You'd probably take the car out on a course. It might not, it might not even do too bad, especially if it has that yield sign on there. 
at which point you take it out onto the highway and discover that you have a big problem with, with your with your in that case, the problem started by someone getting into the data and deleting things from it. They changed the data distribution. That's called data poisoning. You can also inject data and make sure that no Canadians ever get mortgages in the state of Utah. You can do that, right? Putting bad credit history records in there for Wayne Gretzky. So the, the key though is with data provenance is initially you kind of look at that as a, uh, a data protection problem. We'll just stop people from monkeying with our data. It's not that easy, mainly because a lot of times we're getting data. Let's say we want to train on images. We're probably going to go out to a big Google library with 100 million images. We're going to bring that in. Well, has anyone tampered with that? Is that, that data that we just brought in, let's say we're trying to identify cats versus ducks. Does it have a representative population of cats, ducks, and not cat ducks? Um, all of that is very, very key. So some of it's outside of your hands. The other thing is, let's say I've trained a model to give retail discounts. Uh, we want our best customers to get the best discounts and we're gonna recommend things they like, sound familiar. And in doing so, uh, we've got an AI model that's gonna make predictions on that and it's doing a terrific job. Now, all of a sudden our sales have just plummeted. Something happened and we find out that that model is steering everyone to buy fishing line and fishing line only. Well, what, what happened? Well, AI, much like you guys know, it's not like, well, I'll just go to the code and see what changed. That was a whole training cycle that something got trained and passed tests. So what is that? More than likely, it is something from the training data. So with data provenance, I can go back in. Where did this data come from? When was it last changed? What was added? What was updated? What was deleted? Who did that? When was it done? I can go back and put that provenance together. It's an insanely hard problem. Again, we're not talking about 10, 20, 30 data points here. We're talking about literally billions of data points and looking for subtle manipulations of those. Uh, that's my thing. So keep your eyes for other initiatives like DPI uh, that are going to be coming out. Okay. I said a lot. I machine gunned a lot of information. You guys probably only remember my mom's this tall. But questions? Have any questions? Yes. Exactly. So there's a, uh, I think I can talk about it. So there's a company out of Israel called DeepKeep. Um, they just came out of stealth about a month ago. Um, and they're doing exactly that. They're going back and they're looking for patterns in the data. Again, my funky example of deleting yield signs would be rather easy to do that. But if you're making subtle changes over a long period of time where you're minutely adjusting the data distribution, that's much more difficult to do that. Well, DeepKeep is built exactly for that, and in its core is a, an AI model. That's a beautiful point. Yes, I can't remember the company's name, but it was the first example you gave for companies using generative AI. Um, what was the name of the company? That's a key point, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So in the document handling space, if you have tons of documents, and by definition, most of them will be obsolete, they'll be outdated, they'll probably be inaccurate. Um, that has to be taken into account in your model. Um, there's a job, have any of you heard of the job description prompt engineer? Yeah. So one of the goals of a prompt engineer is to make sure that when you ask for the sales data, you're asking it in a way that you're going to avoid some of that. So for instance, you may say, based on information from the past three months, 
what has the sales projections for the Mideast region be, as an example. And so that's the subtleties of engineering the prompts that are going into the system. That, that's one technique. Um, there are other uh, systems out there that will go ahead and take a look at your data and give it a weighting, right? To where not all data is created equal, um, to where maybe some of the data from later phases is given a, a much more uh, a much more prominent role in coming up with it, with analytics. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Other questions? Oh yes, uh, I'll start here and work over this. Yeah, how did the frameworks take into account different regulatory standards? How did the different frameworks take into account different regulatory standards, say between the EU and GDPR? You talked about PII versus what California requires versus. So how do you take that into account with your data and language models? Right now, it's a minefield. So the EU just came out with an AI policy that they just released, I think it was a couple months ago. The White House had the executive order talking about the shoulds and shouldn'ts of AI. Uh, you mentioned some privacy laws like GDPR and CCPA. So they certainly differ out there. Right now, there isn't exactly that law, maybe, maybe with the exception of the EU recently that hasn't been tested yet, that says you're supposed to do this, this, and this. There's a landmark case going on right now. I'm sure you guys have heard about where the New York Times is suing Microsoft and OpenAI for copyright infringement. You can better believe that everyone in the industry is watching this. This is going to be a landmark case that uh, our grandkids, when they go to law school, are going to be taught about this case. Right. This is going to set precedent here in the U.S., and, and that's going to have a ripple effect. Let me tell you about a law you might not know of that's really bizarre. So uh, I mentioned that generative AI can create uh, images, videos of presidential candidates doing gymnastics if they want to, whatever. Right? Um, there is a country out there uh, that has enacted a law a year ago, so January last year, that says all generative material, text, image, audio, uh, by the way, there's other types like MRI images, seismic data, um, that they have to have a digital watermark. If your generated uh, artifacts don't, you're in violation of the law. If you tamper with a digital watermark, uh, you face twice the penalty. That country is China. China has one of the most protective AI laws on the books right now for generative AI data. Uh, there's a lot of countries that are looking at that kind of saying, well, I don't know, like maybe that would work here, maybe that wouldn't work here. You take that and couple it with the New York Times, and you're starting to see these frameworks, that bedrock of policies. Right now, though, it's kind of wild, wild west. Um, and unfortunately, as we saw with crypto, how many people here uh, bought a house using cryptocurrency? I thought we were all going to do that. Um, no, so that was a wild, wild west phase, right? Not a lot of regulation. SEC didn't really know what to do with it. Um, there's lots of documentaries on Netflix right now about Bitcoin scams and things of that nature. Um, I have a feeling, I wish it wasn't so, but human nature being what it is, I think we're going to see the same thing in generative AI. Um, and so until some of those regulations get put in place, until someone pays you know, the billion dollar fine or the 20 uh, years in jail, um, it's going to be a little bit nebulous. By the way, I don't encourage you to test to test the Chinese law. I have a feeling they're pretty serious. Anyway, does anyone else have any other questions? And I'll come around with the mic. And I, and I, the gentleman in the Veritas. I, 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 I was just saying that you know, just like any technology, the good guys do good things, and the bad guys even do worse. So, yeah, how's it addressing the bad guys? How are they using this AI? Well. It, you you are onto a whole kettle of fish. So I do have a column. I have a I have a uh, column in IEEE uh, that I write every quarter, and I've spent a considerable amount of time on the security side of AI, uh, not just how to protect your AI models, but what the baddies are doing. The easiest uh, example to point out would be phishing attacks. So you know, the I'm a Nigerian prince. By the way, how many Nigerian princes do we have? But, uh, you know, it's become so ubiquitous and so famous. But you now, in many companies, have training that you have to take every year. And it says, look for typos and grammatic errors and look for the email address. Okay, those days are gone. You're going to get something where you have, remember at the beginning I said there's a discriminator that you can train to where it knows a picture of the hot dog? You can also have a discriminator that knows your CEO's linguistic map. 
And so then when you generate a phishing attack, it's not going to be you know, anything particular. It's going to be coming from your CEO using their speech idioms. You know, my CEO always uses two periods at the end of a sentence. Oh my gosh, there we go. Right? It's going to have internal jargon. It's going to have names, dates. And oh, by the way, all we need is $350,000. Right, but they're very, very sophisticated. It gets really scary. I'll get to you in one second. You just stay with that for a bit. Um, it gets really scary um, right now because phishing attacks. We've always talked about like uh, email, okay, and there's some great tools we can put on there to help protect us. We're also seeing it in voicemail, text. Uh, we're having synthetic voices uh, in speech generation, where now it isn't just our CEOs. Uh, speech uh, uh, mannerisms, but it's also his voice, accent, tone, uh, diction. Uh, those are all being mimicked also. I'll, I'll ask. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Something I spend, uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about is, uh, well, first off, I think it's fascinating how AI is transforming things and how it's changing so much right now. Um, in the time that you spent and you see where it's going and how it's developed, where do you see the future impact being of in, in AI and specifically in areas and things that other people, it's not on the radar, maybe some even unique ideas and how you think, uh, because I think about how, you know, cell phones have transformed things and businesses have sprung around that we would never have thought of before. Are there any things like that you see that maybe just in general people or the media is not uh, catching on or like, some big trends like that? Okay, I'm glad that I made you wait because that is awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, let me give you one. So we talked about different types of models, right? Generating uh, text and language, generating images, generating voices, generating video. Um, right now, there's a big push for what they call multimodal models, which is hard to say real fast. The idea of how do I combine those together to where I not only have uh, something like chat GPT coming up with a Shakespearean sonnet about Southern Utah, but I also have a voice uh, that goes along with it and a face that's animated in effect. Those multimodal um, uh, technologies are at various different stages. Um, without getting into weeds on it, there's this thing called the uncanny valley. And that is that as you get an AI model more and more accurate, um, you'll, let's say 100% is human indistinguishable. I can't tell this voice from, from my mother's real voice. Um, and let's say you've got that curve. It turns out at about the 90th percentile, it goes through a huge dip. It's where the voice is kind of right, but kind of not. And it looks creepy, sounds creepy, acts creepy. We've seen kind of, like if you remember back the early C CGI movies or whatever, you look at them now, at the time they blew our minds, you look at them now, they're kind of cringy. That's what they call the uncanny valley, that dip right there. So for instance, uh, synthetic speech is across the uncanny valley. There are speech models out there, a company called Gridspace, if you're curious, go look at their demo, absolutely fascinating. Uh, but they've got speech that I guarantee is undistinguishable. There are companies working with the faces, companies like Soul Machines and Unique, um, and their models are kind of coming out of that right now. They're, they're probably coming next. The decision-making, Depends what the decisions are, but there's some on one side of the balance, some on the other. But what, imagine a world where those are all pulled together, right? And when those are pulled together, it's a technology that a lot of us researchers are calling the digital human. That I go to a website to book a flight, and the receptionist is there, and they're issuing me a ticket, and they maybe have looked up some stuff, and they welcome me back by name, and you're just chatting, so to speak, and you get that flight ticket where you want for the lowest price. That's great. That's wonderful. The next step beyond that, though, is digital self. And this is what uh, we're looking at. This may be a couple of years out. The idea here is that you're taking that agent and you're flipping it. It's not me going to the airline's website and booking a ticket. I have a digital self, and I might have multiple of them. This one's really stingy. This one's really aggressive. This one is oh so nice. And I've got various of myself, and I go out there. I have to be at Cleveland Thursday next week. And I have them all negotiate my tickets. And I come back and I said, by the way, you can get an Alaskan Airlines flight next to the window that blew out for about eight bucks. They're going cheap right now. So uh, that digital self is interacting on your behalf. Now, you probably want to be in the loop on that. 
However, maybe you don't. Maybe it's your stock portfolio and you just want it to be aggressive at the first half of the year and then taper off at the end. Uh, you know, I think things are going to be really wild, you know, closer to the election, let's say. And you give your uh, objectives to your digital self and it trades on your behalf, right? That can happen. Now, all of that sounds really sci-fi and cool and everything until you start thinking about some of the implications. If you have a digital self, God forbid, but you pass away, does your digital self continue? You gave it fiduciary responsibilities over your portfolio. Does it keep trading your portfolio based on your objectives on behalf of your estate? What if your digital self uh, commits sexual harassment? Are you liable? Is the digital self liable? Well, it can't be. This is be software. Maybe the people that wrote that. Maybe the hosting service that hosts it for you. There's ambiguity as to what exactly that means. So that, if we look out a few years from now, and, and by the way, prognostications on AI are uh, kind of sketchy. But if you were to look out, it seems logical that multimodal will turn into digital human, will then get flipped into digital self. And at that point, we've got some societal questions we ask and answer, much like today. That's, a, that's an awesome question. One last question, anyone? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd be, yeah. I'd, I'd be curious because I feel like you showed us a lot of these AI companies that fill a very niche kind of industry um, and recognizing that a lot of them will maybe not exist in a year. If you want to implement AI within your business, you almost build a dependency upon that thing. And if they're kind of in the wild west world that we are, it's like, how, how would you manage the risk of it just like going out of business and no longer having that? dependency? I'll give you three answers and hopefully they're adequate. The first one is there are some general platforms like OpenAI, Anthropic, Cohere, um, Aleph Alpha. There are a number of them out there that are, well, they're, they're, they're huge. Um, as an example, that $27 billion of investment I put up there, $10 billion of that went to OpenAI. That's a lot almost 2.7, one-tenth of it went to a company called Anthropic. Those companies aren't going away anytime soon. So the, that's the good news. The downside is, while well, you're getting the same model and you're unique, just like everyone else, right? So, so go ahead and customizing it, you're probably going to have to bring up something else. The other wild card in the deck is open source AI model. It's hugging face. Uh, th th there's a, a lot of them. Um, Right now we're seeing, if you graph the performance of generally available commercial AI platforms and open source AI platforms, that gap is closing. It'll never cross because I think commercial companies will always be able to bring stuff to market quicker than open source. But it's gonna get to a point where the difference between them, is it worth the cost versus us building it our own software inside? And with the you know exception of uh, you know GitHub going bankrupt, these, these uh, uh, open source initiatives seem to be another answer that companies are looking at for how to implement that in-house in to The third way to do it, um, and I don't want to sound like a commercial, is there are some companies out there that spend all of their time in the emerging tech space and have certain indicators up front. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit how our group does this. Uh, we sell emerging tech into our customer base, and if those companies go bankrupt, that's our need, right? So on one hand, we want to be cautious. On the other hand, we want to be innovative and adventurous. So I can't tell you who the winners are going to be, but I'm pretty active in telling you who the losers are. <laughs> well, oh. thank you so much, Mark. How about we give him a applause? <laughs>